Welcome friends, welcome to the webinar on semi-supervised learning. So in, uh, in the participants who have completed their data science journey or who have completed the data science course, they might be aware of supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning, right? In machine learning, we have got supervised just a moment. <coughs> So we have got supervised and unsupervised. Yes, friends. So what is the difference between supervised and unsupervised machine learning? <clears throat> yes, Fatshaker says output Y is what is supervised machine learning, right? <coughs> Excuse me. And what about unsupervised machine learning? So unsupervised machine learning is nothing but wherein we do not have the output variable of interest. Yeah, uh, the, the session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the learning management system. Probably you'll have to check with uh, you know, Ganesh about it. So this session is being recorded. Now, right? Uh, just a moment friends machine learning and we have also learned about unsupervised machine learning so <clears throat> yes you're right in supervised machine learning output variable of interest is known right we know the output variable of interest over here Major, uh, predominantly the supervised machine learning, is it used for classification techniques or is it used for your uh, regression techniques, friends? Yes, question to you all. Is it, is it uh, used predominantly, is it used for regression or is it used for classification techniques? <clears throat> predominantly, it's used for classification, right? Yeah, this is predominantly used for classification techniques and we can also employ regression using supervised machine learning techniques as well. So we have examples of your supervised machine learning techniques like you have KNN, you have got Nightbase, you have got, then you have uh, SVM, you have got Decision Tree, Random Forest, you have got Many more neural networks. In that way, you have got different, <coughs> excuse me, supervised machine learning techniques. So we have an output variable of interest in supervised machine learning, which we have to classify or predict, right, based on the different input variables. And you have different algorithms which perform differently in order to classify or predict the output. Whereas in your unsupervised machine learning techniques, you do not have. any output variable of interest. Now, <clears throat> when you do not have an output variable of interest, what do you do? Yes, what, what do we do in with the data set that we have? Using unsupervised machine learning techniques, friends. Yes, any thoughts? Here, we just have the input variables. Right, we just have the input variables. We either perform clustering or that is, we try to identify the patterns in the data set. Right, ultimately, we, uh, we you know, identify the patterns, and the objective would be if you are employing clustering or PCA, PCA or SVD, in a way you reduce computation burden. Right. <coughs> Then you have association rules and market basket and uh, sorry recommendation systems, right? So the objective of them are different. <clears throat> so this is the difference between your supervised and unsupervised machine learning techniques. Now, where does this semi-supervised learning falls? 
right? So your semi-supervised machine learning, it falls between supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. So here comes your semi-supervised learning. What exactly is semi-supervised machine learning? It is a combination of supervised and unsupervised machine learning techniques. So it is like, <coughs> for example, but I'll keep to the next slide. What is, what do you mean by labeled data? <coughs> and what do you mean by unlabeled data? Yes, friends, any thoughts? You have got labeled data. You might have heard about while, you know, executing any project or assignments, you might have heard about labeled or unlabeled data. So, so, right, absolutely. So you have the data set and you have input variables. Sorry for that. Right again. You have the data set and you have your input and output variables, right? From here on till here, you have your, yeah. From here on to here, these are your input variables and this one is nothing but your output variables so for example like if we take an example of knn uh, we have employed knn algorithm on benign and malignant that was the labels right assigned to the observations right so that is called as a labeled data set then you have got unlabeled data set. What is unlabeled data set? <coughs> Excuse me. Unlabeled data set is nothing but the data sets that you get for your unsupervised machine learning. Do we have any output variable of interest over there? In our unlabeled data set, we do not have any output variable of interest. We just have all the input variables. Right, friends? We do not have any output variable of interest over there. We just have only input variables. So your data set of supervised, I'm sorry, semi-supervised learning, machine learning will be equals to the combination of your labeled data and unlabeled data. Right, so you will have the combination in this way. The input variables remain the same. Yeah, unlabeled data can also be uh, unstructured. Uh, uh, it, does, it need not be structured. So this semi-supervised machine learning is predominantly used on the unstructured data itself. <coughs> because it is, you know, when we look at the applications of it, it is predominantly used in your unstructured data. So what are the examples like your audio, video files, your text analytics, all this is your unstructured format of data, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. Now, your, the combination, the data set of your semi-supervised machine learning will be the combination of your input and output, I mean the labeled and unlabeled data. So the data set will have, ultimately we're coming to the objective, this will be your output variable of interest. It will have a lot of input variables from here until here. So some of the variables in your output will be labeled. Some of them will be NAs. Or rather I would say most of them would be NAs. So what are you going to do when you have a lot of NAs in the... Yes, friends. What do you do when you have a lot of NAs in your input variables? In the data set, if you have got, you know, NA values, you probably would have NA values in real time. We will be performing imputation, right? Handling the missing data, missing values. So in that way, this is kind of an imputation. Your semi-supervised learning is kind of an imputation. You cannot, you know, <coughs> excuse me, discard the output variable. You cannot discard the output variable or rather you cannot discard your observations. You cannot discard your observations 
only because your output will be of interest not have the labels right so getting the data is a very expensive task on top of that if we are losing the data then we would be left over with very small amount of data and that too this is probably this is the amount of data from this particular data set that will be left over so we'll be lot we'll be losing lot of data now <coughs> excuse me so how do we have to deal with this na values in the output variables right na values in the output variable so in all our assignments we have got the data set either without your output variable or with output variable but did we happen to receive any data set which has got na values in the output variable we probably not right so that is called as imputation of your output variable of interest is called as your semi supervised learning so what do you do how do we have to deal with it it is again called as something called as your <coughs> excuse me friends it's also called as pseudo labeling what do you mean by pseudo labeling you are first before you predict or before you build any model either your classification model or regression model the ultimate objective of the problem statement before you attain this the first job is to impute ns for your output variable right only then will you be able to divide the data set into training and test data and then you can perform the modeling on top of it right is that clear friends now what we have to do over here is you divide the data set like in your exploratory data analysis what do you do you divide the data set into if you have got outliers probably you try to fix it otherwise finally what do you do you divide the data set into two with outliers and without outliers right friends you model them separately finally you combine the results this is what you do in your how do you deal with your outliers this will be the final model model 3 now on similar lines <coughs> here in pseudo labeling what do you do is first the objective is to impute the na values of your output variable of interest so you divide your data set into two halves here on till here you have got input variables this is your output variable and here you have got all the labels with you benign malignant malignant benign benign and so on so this is the data set with labels right and you will have another big data set without labels and here on till here you just have your input variable labels you do not have any output variable of interest that is you will have only nas over here all of them will be ns and the proportion of this data set will be huge when compared to this data set so semi supervised learning is predominantly used <coughs> when you have your unlabeled data in huge proportion so so you what you do is you divide your data set into two equal halves that is your uh, i mean you divide the data set uh, with labels and without labels so this is the data set that you have so what you do is you this becomes your training data set friends and this becomes your test data set now the first objective is to predict these values 
So whether they are either regression or like for example in regression you will be predicting either the for example if it's a multi-linear or simple linear regression you'll be predicting the continuous variables and you have got classification techniques wherein you will have labels right so what you do is you divide this data set into two halves one without or oh, sorry with labels for output and you employ a model and you build another you have another data set here you do not you have just ns without label <coughs> for output this is your train data normally the proportion of training data is huge when compared to your test data right we normally tend to follow 80 20 percentage or 75 30 is 25 percentage but over here this becomes your training data and this becomes your test data right so using this training data you will be predicting these values first right <coughs> So you will be predicting these values and once you predict these values you would be combining the results right so after the prediction what you do is these na values get replaced by the predicted values finally you will be getting the entire data set with predicted values That is your labels and these are your uh, so if i have a question yeah. here uh, sorry to interrupt you uh, so what if the scenario is the other way around like uh, we have only 20 percent of the training data and 80 percent of the test data like 20 percent of label data and 80 percent of unlabeled data yeah that is so what i was trying to say to... yeah yeah we have to go it and in the real time you will have that kind of a scenario this is followed i mean normally we follow this you know this proportion right the thumb rule but here this will be 20 percentage and this will be 80 percentage so even if you have 20 and 80 percentage in the other way you will have to follow you will have to use only this 20 percentage as your train data and you have to predict the values or class you know classify the output variables <coughs> of the test data using this 20 percentage proportion itself because we do not have any chance over here right so okay. is okay. it is it not better to use this prediction or any model over here and get the predicted values rather than losing out this information or rather the entire data if we just go for classification building a model only using this 20 percentage of the data this entire data will be lost yeah there will be errors but then there are you know there's a package you will certainly have errors Madhusudan. we cannot say that it will be 100 percent accurate Certainly, there will be errors because you are predicting. Even if you build a, any model, you certainly will have errors. But then, you know, you will have the, the data with you. The patterns in the final model, in order to build the final classification model, you will have the data, you know, good amount of data with you. So, like your principal component analysis, wherein you lose out some data in order to improve the, improve the computation burden, right? of the uh, model you, know, you can relate it in that way now <coughs> excuse me only we will have 20 percentage of the predicted values to replace the any values can we predict train data and with test data that is what we are doing right this is you know this is the first thing this is to, even if it is 20 percentage we, we are not replacing it Tejaswini, we are not replacing it uh, using these values, we are not imputing it, like we are not using mean or median. So, you know, I'll, I'll just show you in a while, in the next slides. So, it's like you need to employ an algorithm, there's a package in R, which you'll have to use, which is going to do the job for you. Right? <coughs> so, the thing is, using this 20 percentage you're not using any mean median or mode to replace the values 
we are performing some algorithm which is going to predict the values for us. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Friends, can you please uh, mute yourselves? So now, this is your using this data, using this prediction model, you are getting the predicted values for your output variable and you're combining the results. Now, finally, what you do is you train the entire model, or again, you can divide this data set into train 80%. Now you have got 100% of the data. You divide the data set into 80 and 20 percentage. This becomes your train data. This becomes your test data, which is 20 percentage. And now <clears throat> you build your ultimate classification model or regression model. So you build the model using this training data and you predict the values. And after which, whenever a new observation comes in, it predicts with that. For example, if you have got 85 percentage of accuracy for this particular model approximately 85 percentage for both the training and the test data whenever a new observation comes in you will be predicting or classifying that observation with 85 percentage of accuracy right so in this way we are not losing out the data right because <coughs> the reason why we are not excluding the unlabeled data is labeled data is very expensive to get labeled data is very expensive and unlabeled data is inexpensive say for example if you have got lot of images for example if you're performing uh, deep learning and you're employing computer vision so do you think that you would be getting the data set with the labels for example if you have got images different images are you going to get the labels for all the images how are the images <coughs> how does google or you know they <coughs> excuse me they build the uh, computer vision algorithms you initially for that 20 percentage of the data you may have to you know label the data by yourself so this is a very expensive job because of which this 20 percent what to do is you do not lose out the information you do not lose out the data you may have to label that 20 percentage of the data the test data the train data that we have used if at all if the entire data set did not had any any labels did not had any label even though you cannot discard this problem statement you will have to label some amount of data right friends so when you label the data that label will be correct whenever a human labels the data that will be correct right so for example if it's an image of a car of an image of an animal you will be labeling the data unless you make some data entry issue error that <coughs> classification will be correct so probably out of this one lakh rows you are labeling for say 20 percentage of the data right and then remaining 80 percentage you are employing pseudo labeling or semi supervised learning semi supervised learning to label the data is it clear friends yeah so we have a package in r uh, which is called as r s s l so it, it has some assumptions and how does it perform let me just show you <coughs> So, 
Excuse me. Uh, just one question. Uh, one question, uh, sir. So this uh, you you had said when we do the pseudo labeling on the data which has got the output variable as NA. Mm -hmm. So is there a different kind of uh, classifier that we apply, or or is it the normal uh, things that we have done? Like we can do a PCA, or we can do. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we can we can use any of the uh, supervised. Uh, supervised ways that we have, that we have studied till now or is there something different that we have to do for predicting this uh, NAS? Uh, there is something different like you have for R you know it internally will be using the similar kind of algorithms that we have uh, discussed in supervised machine learning so you have got RSSL package using this package you have some functions which is going to employ the predictions and you will be getting the output Yeah, so it has got some assumptions, friends. Continuity is like your algorithm. What it does is, if it's assuming the continuity or smoothness, so not dwell too much in that. So it, you know, whichever, for example, if you are plotting the data points on a multi-dimensional space, the data points which are close to each other will have similar labels. So it gives similar labels to the data points which are close to each other. And in centroids, <coughs> sorry, in, in clusters, it's something like this. We have learned uh, hierarchy and k means clustering, right? So over there you will form the clusters. So the data points within the cluster will have similar kind of a label. So this label, probably if this is if this has got benign, probably one of you know very twenty percent of the data. So majority of the data points. If, if for example, if there are a lot of benigns over here, it it labels all the data points as benigns. And if it has got, you know, a lot of <coughs> obviously, when you have got the similar, uh, you know, data points in a, you'll have the similar data points in a cluster. So you'll have malignant over here, and then they will be classified as malignant. And manifold is not something <coughs> you know of much lower dimension than the input. In this case, we attempt to learn the manifold using both the labeled and the unlabeled data. So it is like it will not <coughs> excuse me. It, it's it's predominantly used for high dimensional uh, data set. You know the data set which has hot, which is it lags, will be using manifold technique. So that is internally done by the algorithm. So let us practically try to and apart from these assumptions the methods using which this uh, algorithm implements is there are these are the different methods friends <coughs> so these are the different uh, kinds of uh, you know techniques that are being employed in semi supervised learning that is generative low density graph based and heuristic the generative is you know we have discussed your naive base right naive base so naive base is, is based on what? Yes, friends, any thoughts? Is based on conditional probability, right? P of classification given data is equals to P of prior classification multiplied by probability of data given classification divided by probability of data, right? So generative models use the my based algorithm to implement this uh, you know, semi-supervised learning and then you have got low density. What it does is it uses <coughs> there's something called as TSPM. We have learned SPM, right? SPM algorithm support vector machines to Reduce it reduces it, it tries to you know find out the hyperplane which separates the data points of different classifications. So you have similar to your SPM, you have something called as TSPM. TSPM. So you know it, it performs almost similar way to your SPM transductive, <coughs> you know, support vector machine. SPM is another method that can be used and there are graph based methods for example 
it's 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 similar to your k nearest neighbor your you know something like this for example if you have the data set in this way and for example if this was your this was one classification and this was another classification you have got less data points or two classifications and when you have included your data uh, i mean the unlabeled data so it has classified the data unlabeled data as well and this is going to become the sorry this is going to become the partition earlier this was the partition to classify them and now this becomes the partition in the graph based so you know <coughs> Graph based works exactly similar to your k nearest neighbor algorithm. And you have got heuristic approaches <coughs> which is based on you know the Gaussian uh, distribution. And over here, <coughs> excuse me, the labeled and the unlabeled data. Uh, probably you know the distance metric or any kernel trick will be employed distance measure or you know kernel trick like your SVM will be employed using the heuristic approaches so let us uh, you know practically implement it this is the different methods and assumptions that the algorithm assumes and follows next uh, your applications before I you know, the, we get into the implementation we just uh, let you know the applications the applications are predominantly in, used for image processing and it's used for classification of web web content it can be used anywhere friends even if you give a logistic regression or a classification technique you know it, it can be employed and it will be employed but predominantly they are used over here image processing and web content for example if you have got <coughs> excuse me you cannot expect the client to give you a data set which is you know labeled entire data set is not is, is labeled you cannot expect that probably they will be giving you some labels and some of them you may have to label it using your analytical techniques so image processing in whenever you perform any image processing most of the labels will not be there you will have to use this semi supervised machine learning and you will have to label that data and once you label that data you will have to employ and come up with a classification model regarding the web content you have got web content right all present in google google gives you all the search results so all those classifications are done by this semi supervised learning friends. So, this is predominantly used for web content and image processing. Apart from that, it, it, it's also used in other areas as well. <coughs> so, we are running out of time. So, we take you all to our half small implementation. So here, our SSL is a package. You can just, uh, you know, so we'll have to install it. It's not installed. Our SSL is a package. You can explore on this package regarding the semi-supervised learning. It has got the documentation within it. Let me see if dplyr or gg.qr both of them are fine so friends what i'm doing is i'm generating a data set a data frame and you know set.cd is to just to get the same results so i'm just running this set.c i'm generating a data set using this function generate to class Gaussian. here you can just go to help and you can look at the 
documentation regarding this <coughs> excuse me the function that i'm using generate to clock to class Gaussian is it's going to give you two classifications and thousand observations. I'm sorry, ten thousand observations, the n value, and you just have to mention the parameters and it's going to give you the data set. So I'm 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 you know creating a data frame using this function and the object has got created df is the object and this is my data set x1 x2 it's taking different values like random values like r uniform the function it's acting exactly similar to your r uniform it's, it's randomly generating your data set two columns and you can see you have got two classifications either plus one or minus one over here right so you can see if i just do table of df dollar class i will be getting equal amount of observations with two classifications 100 and minus 100 so now I have got all the classifications with me, but this technique is employed only when you have got a lot of unlabeled data. So what I'm doing is in order to unlabel the data, I'm employing this add missing labels <coughs> function on top of this class classification variable. And I'm you know putting that in data frame. So data frame using this function line of code, you will be getting the data set. Now when I go to the data set, I will be having a lot of classification, I mean the class variable with NAs. Very few will have your observations. So if I just again go back to the table function and do uh, DF dollar class, you have minus one and so out of 200 observations, you just have two observations. <coughs> Four observations rather right so I'm I'm not imputing it I'm I'm creating any values randomly 98 percentage of my data has to get the inner values is that clear friends <coughs> now what I'm doing is you know <coughs> excuse me here I'm employing this function <coughs> nearest mean classifier nearest mean classifier is to train the classifier I'm creating a training classifier over here and using this training classifier I'm, I'll be predicting the values so this is my training classifier and class is my output variable of interest data frame is my data frame. prior is equal to matrix so when I run this line of code I would be getting a model and I'm using that model to get the self-learning Self-learning is again a method, <coughs> is a function. So when you look at the self-learning, it's case sensitive, right? Self-learning over here. We have got the semi-supervised approach. So you can just go through the documentation. It's going to give you the approach that it is going to follow in order to classify. So you have got these kind of classifier spreads linear discriminant classifier and you know these are the different t svm is there so apart from the you know methods that we have discussed these are the different methods which are also present holistic regression all these methods are present so using one of these methods you can employ so what i'm doing is i'm using self-learning and i have got the output in this fashion now what i'm doing is i'm plotting the data set i'm plotting the two results <coughs> And using the ggplot function and I've got the plot in this fashion now this plot is giving me the classifications yeah so the output variables I mean the label the data points which were not classified have been classified now using the semi supervised machine learning <coughs> Is that clear friends so this is the you know small line of code that i have with me so probably this is predominantly used in image processing and your text mining so that is from my side we have another session 
starting over here. 